UCSC's formal uh, apprenticeship program. Um, so Does I'll, that I'll skip over. <laughs> I'll skip over the, uh, the the two less formal ones. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so so you want maybe just a little overview of like what it is that yeah. that program is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially there's the it's a certificate program through the University of California Santa Cruz Extension, not Cooperative Extension, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a certificate in ecological horticulture, and it's six months training, uh, intensive training. It's a residential program, and uh, folks are, there is a formal curriculum. It is designed to um, integrate mostly practice, but a, um, a considerable amount of uh, theory as well. So practice and theory, uh, classroom hours, as well as the hands-on work. Um, and it is uh, right now, I think it's gonna be somewhere between 6,000 and 8,500 in tuition for that six month period. Uh, granted, you have residential, um, how it's including housing, not food. So if you do the math on it, it's actually quite affordable if you're not paying rent somewhere else. Um, and so folks are selected from um, applicants that come from around the country. Back when I did it 20 years ago, there was 30% of the folks were actually internationals. Um, and um, if you're interested, we actually did a survey of the last the alumni of the last 20 years of the program and analyzed what the apprentices uh, are doing now and what they've been doing since they graduated. What um, what were the key aspects of the program that they found that were the most um, important and valuable, and what were those outcomes in terms of their personal and professional development that they got out of the out of the program at large, but related as to those parts that they said were most valuable. The so, so speaking to those key, I'll just get to those key aspects, which is that it's residential, so it creates a community um, of practice. There's a, uh, as much, people indicated, as much peer uh, education happens as, as from the uh, instructors. Um, and any time that that kind of intensive environment, can, social environment can be created. So people uh, live there on site, they cook three meals, a day for each other, five days a week, living on site, working, um, you know, eight hour days, five days a week with rotations if, if there's irrigation or other things that need to get handled on the weekends. Um, so it's, it's production that happens on um, two different scales. Uh, so tractor cultivated row crop CSA, which is s about six months out of the year between 100, 100 150 members, CSA production. Um, and then there are a num there are two gardens that are roughly three or four acres, uh, and so there's a uh, in those gardens it's entirely hand cultivation, um, biointensive types of approaches, a lot of hand hand built composting, um, whereas in the field which is six acres of six acres of tractor, uh, a couple acres of orchard, and some kiwis. So all of the product from that, most of, most, most of those, there's actually three sites, two gardens and one farm field scale that all goes into cover crop during the winter. Um, but the, the, the growing season product gets sold. Uh, the volume comes through the CSA, it's the largest income generator, but there's also a farm stand at the basic campus. So, that, so uh, apprentices get marketing um, marketing exposure as well as the production exposure in running a CSA, managing a CSA, and also in direct sales. There was wholesale at one point, but we shifted. There's still some small accounts. Uh, okay, so in terms of the, I'm giving you kind of the structure, you can start to fill in probably what the experiences would be. You would, uh, the apprentices rotate between these different sites so they get experiences at different scales. There's a, a tremendous amount of introductory work uh, in terms of horticulture, uh, botany, soil fertility management, insect pest management. I mean, people need to spend some time in the physical environment interacting with these things to get like trigger pressure and like water soil management, plant stress, like those issues. So people are given, the gardens are a really particular great environment for that, um, to get that kind of intimacy and then going out on you know 300 foot rows and afterwards with tractor. Um, there are, the, as I said, the classes will we'll go over different topics, some of which I've already spoken to. Uh, and there's 
I think three quarters uh, of the every once a week over the six month lectures would be um, guest folks. So people coming in, Mark Van Horn's gonna come in a couple weeks and do soils. Um, there are folks that come from all over that will come and do the lectures. Uh, and there's readings. So it's this integration of going out and doing all this work most of the time with your hands, doing the practice of it, and then having a really intensive uh, lecture reading for the abstract concepts. There are also extensive field trips that, that take place uh, regionally. Um, okay, so in terms of income, if you're interested in the budget, the budget basically is run a, a, a third produce sales, a third uh, tuition, and a third um, uh, soft money grants and such. What, so is the what is the tuition cost? It was between six and 8,500. I say that because it's advertised as a certain amount and there's there's internal scholarships and different offsets going on. So the cost is considered about $8,000 It's effectively semester. six. It's effectively, effectively six. six. So either become selected as second years, which are basically teaching assistants. So you become an advanced apprentice. They're, they've kind of formalized it. They're actually giving certificates for advanced apprentices, but there is not the full curriculum in place for that. Um, there is aspects of the curriculum, but it's not finished. Uh, and those, those are the teaching assistants. Each of those three sites that I mentioned have the, the teaching assistant essentially for the follow through the, the winter to overwinter the orchards and all the other work, and then also work as the teaching assistants through that next six month training period. Um, but if you're not in that, that uh, second year program, there we have, we've just got a, um, an alumni website up, but there's a, there is currently very little to no programming. So people basically drop off. And it, and would, that's right here, it would be really interesting is like the incubator projects or the actual commercial farm mm -hmm. apprenticeships, right? Because we were a commercial product, but we're an educational facility. We're not a commercial mm -hmm. operation. Yeah. And that's a very distinct thing. And if we look at light, basically the professional development through these, through these stages, there's ways to articulate these opportunities that, that give people a much more mm -hmm. full professional development. Right, we we're hearing we're hearing a lot of this, and, and I know in Linda's grant, this is really a big deal. This is beginning farmers and ranchers, and the and the the idea is, um, how do you get? And we're talking about how do you get work? How do you get the job out of this? Where are those career opportunities? Um, it's it's that mismatch uh, that we were talking about, Bruce. That so mm -hmm. happens uh, in workforce development. You know, it's that just in time piece. You know, you have to have the workforce ready at the same time that the employer is ready to hire. Right. And it's 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 a very delicate. So our graduates might very well be going to you to get all the business. Mm -hmm. And for example, we don't let we basically don't let our first year apprentices on tractors. And anybody knows if you're going to be in agriculture. <laughs> we we so. don't let anybody on our. Right, but I mean, like, at some point, they're going to have to get some tractor time. They're going to have to work with farmers in a, in a commercial, non-educational commercial, uh, ex, you know, be exposed to the business management sides of these things. So you might, I'm getting at, like, there are strengths to each one of these, and right. we'd be very curious to see how things could be more designed in terms of looking at the developmental phases and learning outcomes that we want to, to deliver on. Uh, you know, I don't even need five minutes. I just want to acknowledge that many nonprofits have had teaching components that connect up with the practice of farming and making farming available. Um, at the at Green Gulch Farms and Center, we've had an apprenticeship program for 25 years, bringing, carefully interviewing 10 to 15 apprentices a year, seeing if they want to come and learn meditation and also receive instruction in organic farming and 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 make this make the commitment to learn as much as possible practically about farming and, and connect that to, um, to living and training at a, in a Zen community. I just want to make sure that we acknowledge places like Green Gulch, uh, Occidental Arts and Ecology, the Esalen program, and many of our graduates from the apprenticeship program at Zen Center go on to work at UCSC. At the, in, in, you know, Mark Sammons, Liz Malazzo, people who've trained at Zen Center go on because they want to take it to the next phase. So there is an active participation in learning together and in serving and in farming and practice. And, uh, and I'm happy to say that the Ecological Farming Conference has begun to acknowledge programs like the, like the student farming program at Essel and the UCSC program to not only show successful farmer programs, um, but also to show that nonprofit world is really coming in and finding that this is important too. So again, it's another partnership and, uh, and I think a very lively one. And then I, I want to just in connection with Lindsay, 
just um, acknowledge inspirational teachers. Mm -hmm. So for the behind the UCSC program, behind the Zen Center program, working with a teacher of the caliber and training of Alan Chadwick, that inspiration was huge. It, it radiated out and continues to radiate out. So it, it's another cor you know, corroboration of what we're doing. And, um, and I think what's, what's needed now is to really look at what's possible to do on, in, within community college, the kind of partnerships we're looking at today. That's, there's a real call, so that's all I wanted to say. One of the things I want to see us do is to figure out how all of the people in this room can help each other achieve their objectives. For those of you who are um, interested in, in finding, uh, trying to establish connections to employers and others, um, um, I take that very seriously. Sustainability is not just about the land, it's about earning a living. And uh, as a workforce development dean, that you know, makes my heart so. Um, this just kind of gives you a sense of how we started. There are a few of you who weren't around when we started, and we just wanted to um, kind of give you a sense of, of how that all happened and how that came to be. As you've been hearing over and over again, the whole idea here is you cannot do this alone. Uh, when I was approached about having a farm here, I said, you know, Conservation Corps, they're 24-7, 365. You cannot do a farm on a school schedule. Your high point of production is when everybody's gone. So there's a real issue associated with time in the farm. So that's what we used to look like up in the upper left, down here, first class in 2009. Um, so we've only been around a few years. When you get up there, I think you'll be impressed. This is the plan. We call this the Bible. I was meeting with our president a few weeks ago. We were talking about our next phase of sustainability. He said, I guess we're going to have to write a New Testament. <laughs> because we call this the Bible. Um, what's fabulous about this is the person who wrote this plan, when you read through this, when you get a really great concept, we have, you know, it's all conceptual, right? We have followed this, and this has served us over the last three years. It's been phenomenal. Um, this is what I took to the Board of Trustees. They had to approve it. We had to do a land use sharing agreement. And to this day, we get to do stuff on the farm without extra approval from the board because it's in the plan. Um, of course, the plan doesn't matter. you got to have the right people. A few familiar faces here. The guy in the upper right corner, Steve Quirk, one of our favorite, um, let's see, I can't call him a moon disturber, but we all know what I'm talking about. But he's the kind of person on the first day of the first class, he said voices told him, have them plant something. He grabbed some plants out of his own yard, brought them to the class, and those students were out there in the dirt the first day. And we're in our fourth year of keeping seed from that first planting. There you are. Uh, we have some of our favorite rustic bakery and, and other. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Favorite lettuce, noble lettuce. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It jumps around until it's all alive in your mouth. Okay. <laughs> four, four classes each semester. That is a teeny weeny weeny program. Um, we, before we launched the farm, we had about 40 to 50 unduplicated students in our environmental landscape program. I had to go to the mat to save that program, but we did because we knew the farm was coming. In one semester, we grew our program fourfold. So we had the right people, we grew the soil. What's that in the middle again, right?
couldn't, we, can't, we can't do that without UC extension. We, we can't manage those numbers. Uh, and then we'll have our state approved apprenticeship program. Another uh, two of our, you know, the usual suspects. Paige on the left is the person that really got, you know, she, she was, she came to, in the first class we had to solicit people to come to the class. So she came to us from Marin Organic. We called and said, you have to send somebody, otherwise this class isn't going to fill. We begged. And so Paige came, and it, 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 it is she who called the Department of Labor Standards and, and worked out the apprenticeship arrangement with Peter. She was unfailingly persistent. And then Matt was also in our first class. <laughs> okay, and then we got some funny, did, 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 we fixed that, I guess, right? We had two million before my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we thank you. But this was, and it, oh, it's, but it's not Bill and Melinda Gates. It started with an application to Bill and Melinda Gates. Am I right about that? Yeah. This is what it's all about. Sustainability is not just about ecological sustainability and, and social equity. It is also about um, sustainability economically, and that's what all forming as a field is. Here are some of our um, our clients, restaurant accounts. Um, we're probably we've been talking. We're probably going to face out a little bit of farmers market. We did because we have to get we have to face what is it that's going to be giving us great revenue. I just wanted to give you a sense of where we're going, uh, what the place is going to look like when we go up there, and a little bit of how we got started. You know, we talk a lot about the, the agricultural part of this story, but there are restoration consultants and, and nonprofits and native plant propagation things that are still part of what we envision happening. They're on our advisory committee, and so making connections there to those sectors and to those parts of the community have been important. And then, as we've mentioned, as, as Nanda mentioned there in a couple of slides, community education is something we do a lot of. And, um, in our case, the Master Gardeners have played a monumental role in doing courses on Saturdays for the community. Um, and I, you know, they run um, almost 10 now, and they've got a great plan for the next one. They had a, a beekeeping workshop just three weeks ago. Uh, standing room only, really, and standing room passed when it was supposed to end. I mean, they were here for a long, long time. Um, and, and they work really closely, again, with the CCMB staff of the community. So, uh, to make those things happen. But, it, but it's just been a great, uh, I'll say stage, a place for us to bring the community, let, give them a chance to be on farm. And I hope what the Master Gardeners do is handle that in a way that's efficient for the partnership because a lot of, you know, you imagine staff time. Well, we've got 300 volunteers and I think there are at least 20 that put time in at the farm. So um, this is something then just outside of what's happened here um, just as you go back and think about cooperative extension in your counties, you know, clearly you have advisory committees, and I know that some of our advisors here in Marin are actually on the San Rosa JC Horticulture Advisory Committee. We can serve in that capacity for starters. Our advisors, our staff can be available just on that kind of quarterly basis, biannual basis, just to be on your committees um, and then be active members. We can serve a, a faculty role. We can, we can sign up and, and teach classes. Uh, as an adjunct faculty member, uh, or just with your current faculty, provide guest lectures. Um, give a couple hour talk relevant to what we're doing and how it fits in with the curriculum of that particular class. So think about us that way. Um, and then just, yeah, anything that you're interested in, you just want to go knock on the door and say, what's going on back on the campuses relevant to these different topics? Not just agriculture, but, but other sectors that you're interested in, in family and consumer science or um, environmental horticulture. Um, we have people, natural resources, watershed management, we have people that can connect back to campus and resources that way as well. So whether they're going to be a formal partner or some of these other support roles, we, we can do all of that. 